today's session. Uh, we've had uh, three, this is the fourth terrific day of Agile Europe 2016, and I am so proud to be here and so thankful to the organization for inviting me. This session is called Hacking Culture for Change Management. I think that many of you have attended several sessions where you've read, heard about things like, I don't know, value stream mapping was my session yesterday. You've heard about building trust in organizations. You've heard about uh, introducing a lot of techniques like uh, retrospectives, product owners, scrum masters, several things. But then at the end of the day, my experience tells me that everyone comes back and they say, yeah, but you know, how do I convince my manager? He's against this idea. And yeah, we are starting with a transformation, but everyone is against it. Or, oh, they say they are doing Agile and they are Agile, but they are not. In fact, they are doing the exactly opposite and they are resisting. Or, how do I convince my client to be Agile? So, it end, um, mostly everyone is struggling to introduce new ideas in their organizations. We have a uh, terrific session yesterday by Mr. Stephen Denning about how using how to use storytelling in order to convince people, in order to build people into ideas. And I want to extend this um, this concept of change management and talk about how to bring new ideas, any kind of ideas, to any kind of human organizations. Of course, my background it's in uh, agile transformation, so I will refer to that a lot. But please keep in mind that this is the same techniques that you can use in order to influence. I don't know the board of the school of your children, or maybe uh, your football team, or maybe your local community, whatever. It's always the same. It's human organizations, and there's several patterns that we can use in order to influence them. I will present myself briefly. This is what I call my vanity slides. My name is Angel, which is rather unpronounceable for most of the people around the world. Angel Medinilla, I come from Spain. People ask me, do you live in Spain? And I'm like, well, live is a, is a big word. I park my car in Spain, okay? <laughs> I have a car that is parked somewhere in Spain if nobody's using it right now. But yeah, I'm originally from Spain and I'm working uh, with many uh, companies around the world. Um, I founded a couple of companies. Right now I'm promoting Improvement 21 based on the work that I uh, reflected in my book, uh, Agile Kaizen. I'm not gonna bore you with that. But it's interesting that you may want to visit this website, projectalis.com slash em slash and the reason you might be interested is that there's links to all of our materials, including the slides of this talk, the slides of yesterday's workshop on value stream mapping, there's also all the materials we use in our Scrum courses, Kanban courses, Agile contract courses, coaching Agile teams, continuous improvement, uh, improving retrospectives, I don't know, there's like 78 or 80 slides uh, slide decks uploaded right now, and there's also several videos of talks that I'm giving around the world on several topics. So you may want to visit in order to have uh, access to those materials. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have been traveling around the world working with small, medium, and big enterprises. Yeah, I'd say that's it's a privilege, absolutely. Um, and I have the privilege of having working. With, uh, I have been working with several kind of uh, companies. I've been working with banks, insurance companies, finance, government, military airspace, logistics, dot coms, video games, mobile applications, telco companies, I don't know, you name it. Um, this gives me a, a vantage point where I can say, okay, there's things that never work. They haven't worked anywhere. So probably there's something wrong with these things. And then there's things that work always. If you try this, it always works. And then there's things that happen here and they work, but then they do have other, they doesn't work here. And uh, what's the reason that they might be working here? What are these guys doing differently from there? So this experience is what I try to transfer in my talks, my books, my writing, my work as a consultant. Beyond talking about what I read in the books or about the theory of how things should be, what I'm doing is transferring my experience, uh, which is a limited experience, but I can tell you what has been successful for me, what has worked for me in the past, and maybe with any luck, you can use that in your own companies in order to build the same results. I'm also part of the Management 3.0 Trainers Community, uh, that's it, those were my vanity slides. Um, <coughs> oh look, a kitten! <laughs> There's a kitten in my presentation. Isn't it cute? Look at the kitten. Oh, how cute. The reason that there's a kitten in my presentation is that scientific research shows that if you put a kitten on your slides, you get 25% better feedback at the end of the talk. That's guaranteed. Okay? So it doesn't matter if the talk is absolutely useless, there's kittens in the talk. So, so please remember the kittens when you leave feedback. 
Also, some people have been curious about the drawings that I've been doing in the slides. All the drawings I do uh, done by yours truly. Um, it's a uh, I use an iPad, a regular iPad and a regular stylus, any program or any software will do. And if you're curious about this thing of visual facilitation, graphic facilitation, I had some flip charts in the jam session room with several drawings, icons, containers, text that can get you started, like, like kick-started into this thing of drawing. There's a, I don't know, a wide, a, a very active community around visual facilitation, graphic recording, beyond, I mean, uh, close to the Agile community. In most Agile conferences, there's people doing sketch notes, drawings, and all that. And it's fun, and it's also engaging. Anyway, uh, my question though was those were my vanity slides, and I have something like 50 minutes and 50 slides coming, okay? So be ready because this is going to be fast. So, change, bringing change into organizations, bringing new ideas into your organizations. Have you ever been in that situation where you had this idea like, oh my god, I was in this conference about agile methods, there was this thing called Scrum, it's amazing, it's the next big thing, we're gonna try that, we need to try this thing, agile software development. You bring that idea to your organization, you are so enthusiastic, and then somebody boom, blows it. Nah. Stop talking about that nonsense. Immediately, like with no reasoning. And then you start listening to these kind of arguments that are so repeated over, over and over and over. That will never work here. I always wonder about the boundaries of that here. Do you mean here in this room? Here in this building? Is here in this company? Is here in this city? Is here in Poland? Is about that agile will never work in Poland? Or is about the whole Europe? Is this in the North Hemisphere? What's the boundary? Where's the limit where you say it works there, but here it won't? <laughs> Makes no sense, no? It's like, what do you mean it, 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 it won't work here? Or for instance, you're like, that's not how we are doing things. I get that a lot. Oh my god, if I had a time. You're consulting at a company and you say, oh, you should be doing cross-functional teams, like, you know, having the analyze, the developers, the testers, the, the, the infrastructure guys, all sitting together, and they say, yeah, but that's not how we organize teams. And I'm like, that's the reason I'm advising. So you try something else. Do you think they're gonna pay me to advise you to keep doing the same freaking stuff? No, but that's not how we do things. Of course, that's why you have problems. <laughs> I get that a lot. That's not how we do things here. Then you also have like, oh yeah, agile, and you know, post-it notes, and having meetings standing up, and all that. That's so American, right? Like, the American people love this kind of stuff, and they are like touchy-feely, and all that. And I'm like, what do you mean? Americans, like, we invented this industry, we are the top leaders, we have the biggest companies, we are the ones marking the technology. Or well, Americans in, uh, in, in, in the sense of, I don't know, Donald Trump voters. Uh, because if it's about being the leaders of the industry, I'm really, really interested. Uh, what's, what's this thing? Ah, oh, yeah, that's so American. That's not for us. Or for instance, you are like, uh, the last resource that people will try in order to resist change is like, yeah, yeah, this kind of thing is interesting, but what about cloud? We have to be moving to the cloud. Or what about the, the budget? We have to finish the budget. What about this other thing? It's like, oh, look, the moon is made of cheese. They're trying to distract you. That's like the last resource of people when they don't want to reason with you and they have no arguments, but they just feel uncomfortable about new ideas coming to your organization. And it's like in this movie, uh, it was uh, Up. Do you remember this Disney movie? There was this dog, and he was, uh, he was like, yeah, nah, he was talking, and then suddenly he was like, swear. <laughs> so it's like, he got distracted. And people will try to distract you, for you from your idea. And, and if you try to analyze all these kind of arguments, this will never work here, that's so American, that's not how we do things here, yeah, yeah, what about this other thing that we have going on? There's no reason behind, there's no argument, there's no rationalization, it's basically emotional. It's, it's, you can't argue with that because there's no argument. And then when you see that people respond to your idea, which is a nifty idea, you, are, you realize, you truly believe that the idea is a good thing. Nobody brings change because they think that it will be bad for the organization. People bring new ideas, people try to, 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 uh, try to introduce new ideas in organizations because they truly believe that these new ideas are needed, that the change is needed, that this is a good thing. And then people won't listen. 
and they won't even argue. They will use these fake arguments. So it's very tempting to fall into what we call the attribution mistake. The attribution mistake basically is thinking, I am surrounded by idiots. And every single time I say, I am surrounded by idiots, there's someone in the audience saying like, <laughs> Yeah, I've been there, okay? I've been in organizations, I've been in situations where I say, yeah, I'm surrounded by idiots. It's the only possible explanation. But of course, that's a mistake. If you think that you are surrounded by idiots, the only solution is to get rid of those people. So you move to another company. And then two years later, you are saying to yourself, I'm surrounded by idiots again. How on earth did this happen? And you keep moving to another company and another company, and you expect that in a given moment of your life, you will be surrounded by talented people that will get your ideas. That's a mistake. You keep thinking that the problem is people are idiots, nothing will actually change. There's a, there's a very good book on change that's called Switch. I do recommend this one because it's entertaining. It's not like a scientific or technical book. It's very, very entertaining. And they talk about the attribution mistake and they talk about this experiment they did in cinemas in the United States and they gave people huge buckets of popcorn, and then to some of the people they gave extremely, absurdly huge buckets of popcorn. And the popcorn was even stale, it was not like tasty, uh, delicious popcorn, it was a stale popcorn. And at the end of the movie they took the popcorns and nobody was able to finish the buckets because some of the buckets were huge, and some of the buckets were just insane, and they weighted the buckets. And what they found is that the people that had insane buckets, they ate 30% more popcorn than the people that had huge buckets. So they came to understand that for Americans, they eat according to the size of the container. When you see the Americans, these buckets of ice cream and these huge bags of potatoes and things like that, and they realized that the size of the container was actually making people eat more. So if you think, oh, Americans are fat gluttons, you will probably not be able to change that. But if you say, oh, American uh, food container size is too big, you can change that. That's something you can influence. Influencing people and influencing their, their mind, especially when you don't believe in them, that's difficult. But influencing their environment, changing things around them, that you can try. So the first thing you have to understand is, why people are resisting change in such an irrational way? You have to understand change dynamics. And it is something that I only realized well into my career. I was so frustrated for many years because I was so, so convinced and sure that my ideas, not my ideas, the ideas that I had been exposed to, about agility and scrum, they were so right. Oh my God, they made so much sense and people didn't get it, and I was so frustrated, I'm surrounded by idiots. But then I started to learn about change dynamics, and I started to apply change dynamics, and then guess what? I started getting better results. So I'm gonna try to explain you why and how people change. For instance, the first thing you have to understand is that you will never, ever, convince people with facts. If you were, if you were able to convince people with facts, all of us will be eating five to seven pieces of fruit and vegetables a day. And we will be doing between four to six hours of moderate cardio exercise a week. Because science and facts shows that that's good for you. You're going to live more years. You're going to be happier. You're going to have more energy. You're even going to have better sex. Guess what? We're not doing that. It makes no sense. The facts show that this is a good thing. And we're not doing that. Because facts alone are not enough. <coughs> if facts were enough, nobody would smoke. So the thing is, you have to address the emotions of people in order to make them change. Because we are emotional animals. There's even some neuroscientists saying that we are not rational animals. We are rationalizing animals. We act according to our emotions, and then we rationalize that, and we say, oh, it's because and we try to give a reason that we acted that way. But we always play emotions first. Let me show you a video. I will need you all to, uh, you know, elevate a small prayer to the god of audiovisuals and try to see if this video goes on. <laughs> it should work. It has worked all around the world. Ah, uh, yeah, I think so. So this is an experiment. Some of you might know this video. This is an experiment where you have two capuchin monkeys in separate jails 
and you've taught the monkeys to use small stone coins to exchange them for food. So they know that when they give a coin to the, to the scientist, they get in exchange a slice of cucumber. And these monkeys love cucumber. But in a given moment of the experiment, they start feeding the second monkey grapes. And these monkeys love grapes. So let's see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. So now, that's what she does. First monkey sees that there are grapes she around. A grape. Looks for a coin. Oh my god, and the other one sees that. Gives the coin to the examiner. And he receives a slice of cucumber. such an irrational way, and I'm like, no! <laughs> Never! <laughs> you don't have, like, silver bucket, you know, the silver bag gorillas on top of the organization. And of course, you know, there's a book that I always recommend, I also recommend, which is called Predictably Rational, and it talks also about how human beings can act in many rational ways. Like, for instance, you're happy with your salary. And you're going to work and you're like, I'm super happy with your salary. But then you find out that your colleague is getting paid more. <gasps> what? He's getting grapes and I'm getting cucumber. And then suddenly you're not happy anymore. But you're getting paid the same. <laughs> I mean, you were happy yesterday with your salary. You're not happy today anymore. Salary hasn't changed. The only thing that changed is that now you think that this is not fair. Which is not rational. You're getting paid the same. You were happy yesterday. So this happens over and over and over. We're emotional beings, we're emotional beasts. And this is one of the reasons that people will react against the change, emotions. Another reason, the brain is not your friend. People think that we are rational beings and that you can uh, trust people to be rational and use your brains and use their intelligence, but you have to understand something. Your brain, for instance, um, your brain was very, very cold during the last ice ages. In the last ice ages, we had to, you know, cover ourselves in blankets and wait in caves until we saw that there were buffalo going around. And then we had to throw the blankets away. And then we had to chase the buffaloes, maybe for days, until we were able to hunt a buffalo and eat the buffalo and get the calories and the energy to wait until the next time we were able to hunt a buffalo. So your brain wants you to sit down, do nothing, and save your energy just in case another buffalo passes by. And that's the reason that when you get home, you, and in the morning you say, okay, today when I get home, I'm gonna run 21K. Like yesterday, I, that I always thought about running 21K. I'm, going, I, I'm thinking about running 21K today. I yesterday thought also I didn't. And then when you come home in the afternoon and you're like, okay, now I'm going to run, you're like, yeah, guess what? Looks like it's too hot today, right? It's like hot. Maybe I should wait to another day that it's not too hot. Then tomorrow you're like, it's too cold today, right? Oh, and today's raining. Oh, and today they are passing my favorite TV show. And guess what? Yesterday I went and I did I did the monthly shopping. So now there's ice cream in the in the in the freezer. Mmm, ice cream. And that's the reason that's so hard to do exercise, because your brain doesn't understand why are you running. There's no tiger chasing you, and you're not chasing any buffalo. And you're like, what buffalo? I'm a front-end JavaScript developer. And your brain is like, no, 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 buffalo, buffalo. <laughs> so your brain has an, it doesn't understand what happened in the, in the last 2,000 years. It's still flash, like, what's happening around? It, 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 it didn't make a change. So. And I think that happens. We are short-term maximizers. We prefer things in the short term. Because your brain 
when you have something in the short term, the reward is immediate. But in the long term, that's fictional. In the long term, like, uh, you know, uh, the famous economist uh, Keynes, he said, on the long term, we'll all be dead. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, we don't care about long term. That's the reason that it's so hard to do uh, diets. I know a lot about weight loss and diets. I lost 40k in the last eight, year, in the last eight years. So I had to learn a lot about nutrition and diets and all that. And you know, the concept of I'm going through a diet and I'm going to be hungry for three, four, five months, but then I will do good, that doesn't work. Because every single day, you have to take the decision between I can eat this delicious pile of donuts today, or I can look good in the beach in August. And you are like, screw August. <laughs> I don't know August Angel, the angel that's going to the beach in August. I don't know that guy. I don't even like that guy. <laughs> I'm here. I'm June Angel. And I have a pile of donuts here now. So I want my reward. So I eat the pile of donuts. And then in August, I will say, damn you, June Angel. Why did you eat those donuts? Now I'm the one that has to go to the beach and look fluffy. <laughs> So that's the reason that with that diets and things that work on the long term are so hard. Your brain is not prepared to think on your long term. It needs a lot of discipline and it needs a lot of, of, of training to believe that the efforts and the, and the exercise and, the, and you know, all the suffering that we are going through today will pay off tomorrow. That's why it's also very difficult to save, save money. Because you have to decide if you, if you buy a car today and hey, instant reward, or you put that into a fund and then you have some better retirement 20 years from now. Screw that! I want the car now! It's instant reward. And that's the reason that when you tell people about change, it's very difficult to convince them. Because all change will start with a period of time where we will struggle and we will suffer and it will be difficult and we, will know, we won't know how to do that. And we are convinced that we will harvest the benefits and the rewards on the long term. But for the brain, that's so, so difficult. Another thing that happens, uncertainty favors the status quo. The brain is prepared to favor things that it knows in advance. I know the cave. And someone says, yeah, but what if we won't go out of the cave during the night? We might be able to hunt something. And they're like, hmm, or we might get eaten by tigers. So in the past, the people that were explorers, they got eaten by tigers. And the ones that stayed in the cave, those prospered. And they had children. And, they, and that's the reason that evolution favored the people that stayed in the cave. Most of the people will, be, uh, will not be of the explorer type. They are less explorers than conservatives. Conservatives, oh, whoa, 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 let's keep doing things the same. We know that. It's easy. That's the reason, for instance, that people, you know, all companies are so obsessed with estimates. They want estimates. Why? Because they prefer to be wrong than to be uncertain. And that's true for mostly every company in the world. I prefer wrong data, and it's going to be done by June. We all know it's not going to be done by June. That's wrong. But now we have a deadline. Oh my God, we can sleep at night. But if you ask people when it's going to be done, and they say, we don't know. We will know in the future, but right now, we don't know. You cannot sleep up by on the night, because that's uncertainty. You prefer wrong data. Even if it's wrong, I prefer to have some deadline that to sleep at night, not knowing when the project is going to be done. Another thing, your brain favors negative thinking. It's safer. We prefer the stories about beware of the bear. Beware of the tiger, don't eat that flower, it's poisonous. And then someone says, yeah, but the flower is beautiful, it's poisonous. <laughs> and the person that was like, oh, beautiful flower, and started eating the flowers, that person died. Whereas the person that was like, stop it, stop it, the flower is poisonous, do not get near the flower, that person survived. So evolution favors the person that warns about the bad things and the dangers. Yesterday, Steve Gany was talking about storytelling and he was also saying people get, you will get people's attention if you, if you speak about the dangers and speak about things that are important and related to their safety. You have to tell people why this is important to you and then people will pay attention. And if you want to 
actually inspire people, you have to turn that into a positive story and you have to tell them how we are going to survive the poison and how we are going to be able to prosper. But to get people's attention, you have to understand that people will always favor negative stories. That's the reason that usually if you don't put energy into the storytelling process, if you don't manage the storytelling process in the company, the stories that people will tell in the water fountain, in the coffee machine, are the bad ones. You go to the coffee machine, hey, how are you doing? Oh, you know the last thing about the marketing director? What, he got fired. Oh my God, why? Oh, he backs, he, you know, he, he was against the opinion of the CEO and the CEO fired him. Oh my God, how'd that happen? Tell me more. We always tell the bad, the bad stories. If you go to the coffee machine and, so, and you ask someone, hey, how are you doing? And he says, you know what? I'm actually doing fine. I'm doing terrific. I'm having a very, very good week. In fact, it's a terrific semester. We are getting incredible results. The actual transformation is working like charm. I'm surrounded by very, very talented people. You're like, hold on, hold on. What are you smoking? And give me a, give me a puff. <laughs> Roll it down, baby. <laughs> Why are you smoking these days? Nobody expects that. You expect the gossip. You expect the bad stories. So if you don't put some energy into the process, you will, all that you will get around is bad stories. So all these things that I'm talking about, about the nature of the brain, the emotional nature of human beings, how we favor status quo, short term, bad stories, that means that the deck is stacked against you. You have everything against new ideas, improvement, growing, learning, becoming better organizations and persons. You are, you are fighting a culture of people saying, don't do anything, stop, stay in the cave, wait, don't try anything. That's our nature as human beings. Don't think that you are surrounded by idiots. You are surrounded by human beings. It's the nature of primates, of apes, of humans. And that's the reason that changing culture is a, is a very, very difficult fight. Fortunately enough, during the last hundred years, there's a lot of people that have studied what culture is and how to influence culture. You have people like, like Herzberg, and you have people like Jim Collins and the people in tribal leadership. You have people like Tony Shea that have been talking, uh, have been uh, codifying the internal culture of companies like Zappos. You have people like Netflix, they've also codified their internal culture. And they're sitting on, uh, you know, has a sign, for instance, like I said, Herzberg, I was, I was thinking about motivation. And there's Heim, he's one of the scientists that have been, have been reading, writing a lot about what culture is about. Um, they came to several conclusions. I'm not going to go into the theoretical part of culture, but there's a definition of how culture is defined by, by a common purpose. We have to have a common purpose as a company, as a group. Who are we? What defines this group? Why are we together? Why are we somewhere else? somewhere else? What's the one thing that makes us thrive? That's something that's also discussed in tribal leadership. Uh, then you also have values. Values not like, you know, this plate at the entrance of the building that says mission, vision, values, bullshit. <laughs> That was written by some consultants 10 or 15 years ago, and then nobody believes that. You know the story about the Dallas in Enron? You probably remember Enron. Enron was the company that was the, the, the they, they had this financial scandal that was so huge at the moment before Lehman Brothers. <laughs> but at the moment it was like, oh my God, because it was all corrupt. And they were doing something that they call uh, creative accountancy or something like that. I don't remember the name. Um, and they were bankrupt because it, they were so corrupt to the bone. But still, if you Google for, for Enron values, they have things like honesty and transparency in their core values as a company. So, you know, the values that you put in a plate or in a website, that's marketing. Values are the true values in the meaning of how people actually behave on a daily basis. I would say that culture is a thousand things repeated a thousand times, which is another definition that I found that I like. It's the kind of things we do over and over and over. Culture is how we do things around here. And despite what the website says, and the play in the entrance says, probably people in Enron were exposed to several behaviors that were repeated over and over and over and over, and people would be repeating those behaviors. Um, that's the reason that culture shapes your identity. 
the colors here, uh, probably I have to change them. But you are a green guy, and then suddenly you are in the middle of an orange organization. And you start feeling uncomfortable, because you see orange people all around, and you're a green guy. And you have maybe two or three options. The first option is, I quit, because I don't fit in here. I don't think that this is my company. This is against my own culture, my own values, my own behaviors. I don't want to be like that. The second option is you will become a grumpy, disgruntled employee, employee constantly uh, arguing with everyone and constantly against everyone because you are a round peg in a square hole. Okay? You are someone that doesn't fit in the culture. And the third option, which is what most of the time happens, you will blend. You will become an orange person in order to fit. Because being part of a group, sitting in a group, being connected, being part of the community, it's also part of our primate nature. As apes, as monkeys, we want to believe, we want to uh, belong to a tribe. We want to be part of something. And that's the reason that you change people when you put them into a given culture. And of course, I adopt the culture of my company, I blend into the company, I become an orange person, it becomes part of my own personal identity, and then someone comes and says, I want to change the culture. And of course, the problem is not you are changing the culture, the problem is you are changing me. I became an orange person, now you come and say, we have to be a blue company. Whoa, 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 hold on. Now orange is part of my identity. And you come here, and you say you want to change me without my permission. That's an aggression. That's violence. You are basically hurting me. You're wanting to change me without my permission. I don't understand why. So my first answer, my first reaction will be to defend myself. Okay? So again, more resources you have to understand. In order to, I don't know, I think that understanding these facts helped me in my work as a consultant to be more compassionate to people. When people were resisting change, I were you're like idiots. Your boss hired me, the guru, the expert, in order to tell you how to do things. And now you refuse, you idiots are gonna be fired. And you don't know what you're talking about. And of course that was a huge amount of violence and clash and, and pain. Not only for them, for me. I was, you know, I was coming back to the hotels and biting the pillows at night saying, you don't want to shoot me, it's nobody listens to me. I was in a lot of pain, and then when I started understanding that they were not being mean, they were not being evil, they were not being stupid, they were being humans, uh, they and I started approaching change in a more compassionate way, saying, okay, I understand your pain, I understand your reaction, I know where it comes from, let us navigate it. And it's really, really helpful when you see it that way. Fortunately, change happens. Okay, even despite everything is against you, change happens over and over and over. You can see change in the United States during the 60s with the civil rights movement. You can see change in South Africa with the end of apartheid. You can see change in India when Gandhi started the non-violent resistance movement and they became independent from the United Kingdom. I'm talking about changing continents. I'm talking about changing nations. So when people say, oh, I have to change 500 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, that's a piece of cake comparing with changing a civilization. And it happens. Change has happened all around the history and it keeps happening. But overnight change is a myth. Change doesn't happen overnight. It's like, you know, these cassettes, these audio tapes, uh, lose weight while you're sleeping. Do you remember the Simpsons episode? where Homer Simpson will try to listen to some audio tapes in order to lose some weight. That doesn't work. You know, a lot of people, when I, I mentioned that I lost 40K during the last eight years, and some people that knew me when I was 120 kilos, I was huge, I was massive. Um, and people come and say, wow, you've lost a lot of weight. And I'm like, yeah, of course, yeah, thank you for not listening. What have you done? And I'm like, oh, it's the power of, it's the power of prayer. People are like, excuse me, yeah, it's the power of prayer. Lord, you have to pray with all your faith. And then they look at me and they're like, really? I'm like, no, really, it's diet and exercise, but of course, you try praying. Praying is easy. You can try that right away. <laughs> because if I tell you that losing weight is about diet and exercise, I'm going to like, oh, yeah, well, I've tried that. It never worked here. <laughs> That's not how I do things. <laughs> they want the miracle. They want the 
trick. They want the tip, they want the pill, they want something easy that will make them lose all their weight overnight, okay? And it doesn't work that way. Uh, change is a process, okay? It's not an event. Everyone sees the day that Nelson Mandela is free. And yeah, we go to the streets and we are like, hey, overnight success. From one day to the other, they freed Mandela and they decided to have free elections. And Nelson Mandela, who had been 40 years in jail, he was like, overnight, my ass. <laughs> I've been 40 years in jail. What do you mean overnight? <laughs> it's not overnight. Of course, everyone sees when Martin Luther King comes and says, I have a dream. And you have like, I don't know, 2 million people listening to him. And you're like, wow, everyone woke up yesterday and said, hey, you know what? We should like talk about civil rights. They have been, I mean, there were people fighting for the civil rights since the ages of the, of the war of secession. I mean, the North and the South, you remember that. For 200 years, there were people fighting for the rights of black people, of women, but only when it comes to a successful end, people notice the change. And that's why some people say, oh, it changed from one day to the other. No, it's a process. It's a process and it starts with the small things repeated thousands of times during a long time. Everyone notice when there's a new uh, forest full of sequoias. Nobody noticed a hundred years ago when someone started planting the seeds and watering them and protecting them. So change is something that you will start. Some people are like, how do I change my company or how do I make my company agile? And I'm like, okay, it's a process. You have to start. The right question should be, how do I start transforming my company into a more agile way of working? Where do I start? What can I start doing? But people still want to see it as an event. That's the reason that some people still ask me, how long is it going to take? How long is it going to take the agile transformation? And I'm like, wrong question, irrelevant answer. It's a wrong question because you still think on the terms of waterfall and all or nothing death march projects. You know what's a death march, a death march project? A death march project is a project where you put a deadline and then uh, you say we will be done in two years. You put a deadline in two years time and then you deliver nothing, 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 you reach the deadline, you deliver nothing, you deliver nothing, you deliver nothing, you deliver nothing, you deliver nothing and then suddenly you deliver everything. That's a death march project, and people still have been shaped by that idea. And people still think that the agile transformation is like that. For a long time, we will have no agile, no agile, no agile, and then suddenly on a Monday morning, we will be agile. <laughs> uh, I have my personal belief that many of the frameworks that have been sold these days are very successful because they sell you this idea. Just implement this, and you will be agile on a Monday morning, 8 a.m., promise. Okay. I don't see it that way. So it's a wrong question. You still think that there's a time that we can measure. This is more about continuous improvement. It's about improving your agility during your whole life. You, be, you become more agile and more agile and more agile every single day. And even if you have the, I mean, even the most agile company in the world can become more agile over the next year because they will find things that they can improve. They can find things to collaborate better, to be faster, to deliver more value. So again, irrelevant answer. Imagine that I tell you there's a way to practice something that will make you a little bit happier every day. A little bit. And every single day you will be happier and happier and happier and eventually you will reach the nirvana. You will be freed by the wheel of, from the wheel of samsara. And you say, yeah, how long is it going to take? And I'm like, well, probably it takes uh, three lives or four. And you're like, oh, then I'm not interested. I prefer being unhappy. Ah. It makes no sense. Because you still are thinking on the end, the deadline, a final state. You are not listening to the part that says every single day you will be a little bit happier. So that's how change happens. A little bit of improvement every single day. So the several patterns that you can find in books like Fearless Change, which is like one of the best books I've ever read on change management by Linda Rising and Marianne Lin, uh, How to Change the World, like you hang up a little small book, very easy to read. I think it's free, you can find free copies online in PDF. And then you have Switch, which is a very, very good uh, novel. And then you have, of course, all the classical books by Cotter, uh, and, and by other, many other people. 
And if you study those books, you will find patterns and practices and things that you can use in order to have these small improvements during the, uh, every single day. I will tell you about 20 ideas, 20 tips that I've personally used in order to bring change, especially agile transformation, into many kind of companies all around the world. Uh, it was 20 until my partner made me notice that our company is called Improvement 21. So now it's 21 tips that you can use in order to improve at your company, because of course it has to be 21. And I'm going to organize them using uh, uh, the famous uh, Rogers curve. You probably, I don't know if you're familiar with this curve, I didn't mention it before, but when I said that change is a, is a, is a process, this drawing, many of you probably will know it, this is Rogers curve. Rogers, uh, he wrote a paper about the diffusion of innovations, how to bring new ideas into communities. And he said, when you bring an idea to any community, first of all, you will have 13 to 15 percent of the team of the people that will be early adopters. Those people will immediately say, hey, that's a good idea. But the problem is that you will have another 15 people, probably 15 percent of the people, that will be immediately and irrationally against the idea. No, it will never work there. Those are the laggards. They are against the change because it's change. And then you have a majority of people, 70% of the people are here between the early majority and the late majority. The early majority are somehow like, yeah, it looks like, but I don't know. It doesn't feel safe. You have to show them that it's safe and it's useful and then probably, maybe, they will adopt the change. And the late majority, they are skeptics. No, this won't work here because of this and this and this and this. They will give you arguments, good arguments. Okay. So the things with the skeptics is you have to listen to them because the skeptics will give you some ideas. For instance, I was a skeptic about the iPad. People say, "Oh, why don't you buy an iPad?" I'm like, "Ah, I have a MacBook Air. Same thing, but also comes with a keyboard." Oh no, no, no! But the iPad has a lot of battery life. And I was like, yeah, same thing with the MacBook Air, but you can use the iPad on the couch. I'm like, yeah, I can use my MacBook Air on the couch. Yeah, but you can use it on the train, on the plane. I'm like, yeah, but I can use my MacBook Air on the plane, on the train. People won't listen to me. People weren't listening. I was giving an argument. Show me what does the iPad that does that the MacBook Air is not doing. And then someone said, you know you can do drawings on the iPad? And I was like, tell me more about that. I cannot do that with the MacBook Air. And then someone said, you know that there's an iPad that has GPS? So you can use it when you are sailing and you can put a program, a software that will show you the marine charts and the depths of the water. And I was like, oh my God, I need an iPad. <laughs> because someone listened to me. I was giving the argument. I was like, no, because, and I was giving an argument. I have a MacBook Air. Show me, listen to me. Okay, so that's the importance of the skeptics. So I'm gonna use, and I have like, 20 minutes, this one is lower than I expected. I have 20 minutes for 20 ideas on how to introduce change or 20 things that I use in order to introduce change in organizations in different stages of the change initiative. Like for instance, number one, observe. Before you do nothing, before you start right, uh, you know, uh, shouting, red coats are coming, red coats are coming to everyone so everyone knows that a change initiative is going on and they can react, shut up and try to observe the people and see, try to figure out how the change is going to affect the organization. For instance, something that I do when I start, uh, uh, when I start doing um, change processes in companies or change transformation, the first thing we do is an assessment. We try to see how agile the company is right now. Are you delivering, how do you deliver products? How do you collaborate in teams? How do you collaborate with the customer? How do you continuously improve? And that gives me an idea on what's already working and I can use that as leverage points and what's not working at all and that's gonna give me a headache. So the first thing you should do is observe. And then, uh, this is for instance uh, an example of the observation. What I do is I use these four dimensions of agility. I explained them two days ago in the lightning talk. It's the heart of Agile by Alistair Coburn, I call it the core of Agile. And in each of these dimensions, I run several questions and I try to understand how people are performing in each dimension. And that gives me a beginning state. I can also compare, and a year from now, I can compare how do we started and how are we performing now. So I can see improvement and show that improvement and encourage the change process. I also use, and this is number two, I usually use this assessment to find the cracks. 
There's a, there's a song by Leonard Cohen that says something like, there's always a crack in the wall. That's how the light gets in. It's beautiful, right? And that's true. There's always something that people are uncomfortable about. There's always something that is not working, and everywhere, everyone is like hungry for change there. For instance, people are like, oh my god, we are so over, uh, overloaded with work. And that's the one thing everyone complains about. But then you come talking about coaching and scrum masters and doing daily meetings and, and writing user stories and doing inceptions. And people doesn't care about that because they feel that they are overloaded with work and then you're talking about more things that we are doing. Instead, try to find what hurts and apply things there. You know what? We're going to be limiting the work in progress. Really? So you're going to lower the workload? then suddenly you got people's attention because you are talking about their pain. Not the, one, the things you want to say, the, the things you want to do. You're talking about their pain. Alan Seaman, a uh, certified scrum trainer, I think, scrum coach, uh, he talks about something he calls organic scrum. He says, I don't introduce dailies, uh, boards, post-it notes, uh, planning sessions, user stories. I don't do anything, nothing of that. The only thing I start with is Scrum masters in the sense of someone that knows about agility and scrum, someone that is coaching the team, and frequent retrospectives. And then I will ask the team, what's your biggest pain? And they will say, oh, you know, the problem is that we have seven people asking things at the same time. Huh, that looks like a, a pain. That looks like something that is affecting the team. You know what? Why don't we try asking, for instance, Silvana to be the interface to the team and ask these seven people to ask Silvana for things and she will figure out the priorities and she will try to tell us what's the first thing we have to work on and she will manage that. We should try that. Could we try that for a month or two and see how it goes? And then we try that and we are implementing part of the product owner pattern and people say, hey, you know what? That worked. So now instead of saying you have to have product owners because the Scrum Alliance says so, and you're like, who's the Scrum Alliance and why are we listening to these guys now? Are they in charge? No, what we're doing is solving your problem. You said that you have a problem, we're trying to solve that. Understand the problem you are solving. That's what I talked about in the lightning talk, go to the core of agility. So number three, have a vision and be specific. One of the things that happen is that um, in many transformations we tell people, be agile, and that's like, eat healthy. And you're like, yeah, what's the meaning of eating healthy? I mean, beer is made of vegetables, is that healthy or not? Does it count as a salad? <laughs> you have to be very, very specific. If you want to change people's diet, you have to tell them what they can have, what they cannot have, when can they have it, in what quantities, and you have to explain them why. So what I do in Agile Transformations is instead of saying, oh, be Agile, deliver value, which is like they, I try to reflect that in some metrics. For instance, if you go to hoshinplan.com, that's a tool made for one of my made by one of my customers, and it's an implementation of a lean tool that is called Hoshin Plan or Hoshin Canary. And what they do is they decide a goal for the transformation, and that goal gets expressed in several targets. For each of those targets, we define success metrics, impact metrics. And for each of those metrics, we start defining tasks. And the tasks, like we should be having a product owner, is designed to influence the metric. And we will try to see if the metric moves or it stays the same. So if now we have product owners, but we are not solving the problem, if we are not influencing the metrics, we have to try something else. So be as specific as possible. Number four, find early adopters. That's one of the most important things you have to do in a national transformation or in any kind of change initiative. Who is your community of the ring? Who are the people that are going to be, I don't know, uh, helping you bring the ring to the Mount of Des Mount Doom, whatever. You have to find these people that are going to be with you from the beginning. So for instance, something we, we tried in one of the, in, in some companies is to create communities of practice. We said, you know what, every Thursday at five, we will have one hour or two where the Azure community of practice will meet and we will talk about Azure stuff. And that's going to be after the working hours. Then the people that show up, that's your early, those are your early adopters. Usually the laggards will say, I'm not going to use my personal time to that Azure nonsense. And they will go home, perfect. You got rid of the laggards. 
The worst thing that can happen to you is that a liar decides to come to the community for practice, because that's sabotage, right? But most of the time, if you create some free events and you do it, you do them like at lunchtime or after work, the people that show up, those are your community of practice. Those are, I mean, your early doctors. And then number five, you have to nurture your early doctors. You have to give them things to read, videos to see. You have to send them to community events, send them to conferences. Have you read this? Have you seen this? Have you tried this? Because if you do one big event a year and then nothing happens, people lose interest. You have to keep the change initiative going on. Then one thing is giving people, giving people things to read, uh, sending people to conferences. But then another thing is to give them space to practice. So another thing that I practically do from day one in any in, in, in agile transformation is to start labs. Where labs is something that we will do every two weeks probably. We will have four hour time in a closed environment outside of the working environment, in a, like in a separate room or something. And we will have people trying stuff like, hey, let's write user stories and let's try to understand how to divide a big project into user stories that make sense or let's try to automate tests, or let's understand how JIRA works, and let's, uh, let's try to have a common standard on how are we all going to use JIRA. Or let's read about and, and talk about clean code, or let's talk about non-violent communication. And in those labs, we're going to practice that. It's not only learning, it's not only training, it's about doing uh, live, real practice of the things we are going to be using in our real projects. Then, number seven, instead of thinking on a plan, like uh, this is something that happens also, I, I'm trying to get hired by a company, they're trying to hire me to work in an agile transformation, and they, uh, and they tell me, okay, we want to be agile, we want to transform our organization, we want your help to a transformation, can you please provide a plan for the transformation, can you please provide a schedule, a, schedule, a gun chart of the transformation, and I'm like, eh, no, sorry, it doesn't work that way. It's like, imagine that you have problems with your partner, with your spouse, with your wife or your, or your husband, and then you decide you're going to be investing in your relationship. Can you draw a gun chart for that? No! You have several ideas of things you're going to try. We're going to be spending time together. We have to find time to be with each other without the kids, maybe or without other friends. Or we have to socialize more. Or we have to go out and maybe do some sports together. But that's not like A, B, C, D, and there's no like a schedule and a starting point and an end point. Don't try that at home. Don't try to show your wife, this is the gun chart of how we are we going to solve our marriage. <laughs> that's not going to help. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> so instead of thinking on a plan like A, B, C, think on a series of experiments. You have to grow some lean startup thinking, like we are going to try this today, see if it works. If it works, we're going to keep doing it. If not, we're going to try something else. This is a, what we call a Kaizen board. Uh, we use it all the time. Here you have, uh, we have all the things we want to change, the impediments, the things we, can, we want to work on. And then here are the things that we want to work on in the next sprint. And here are the things that we are working on in the, pre in the present sprint. And for each sprint, I will ask people to tell me what are they going to do, how are they going to do it, who's going to do it, and when is he going to do it. Because sometimes people are like, oh, we're going to be more concentrated. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like interesting. We're going to be more focused. Oh, nice. How are you going to do that? Uh, well, uh, we are going to try it. Yeah, no, 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 but brilliant. I know that you have been like distracted, but how are you going to be more focused? Oh, you know, you're, we're going to close our fists and close our eyes and let you try really hard. That's not going to work. You have to show me something you're going to try. Like, hey, we're going to buy some yellow jackets and we're going to tell everyone that if someone is wearing a yellow jacket, do not disturb that person because that person right now is concentrated trying to solve something difficult. And if you stop that person, you're going to be really, really hurting his concentration or her concentration. Oh, that sounds like a plan. Who's going to do that? Oh, the scrum master. When? On Wednesday. How is he going to buy the yellow jackets? We're going to put our money and he's going to go to the store around the corner. Well, that sounds like a plan. Now do we know what are we going to do? Who's going to do it? When is he going to do it? How is he going to do it? So this is what we have in the board. And then here you have what we tried in the past perspective. Uh, uh, iteration, sorry. 
So here we have the things we did, some worked, some are like, man, we have some success, we still have to try, and some didn't work. The ones that work, we put them in an improvement backlog, like, hey, this worked, and we publish that, and we push it to other teams. And the things that didn't work, some of them we try again, some of them they go back to the payment backlog, like, yeah, you know what, we're not going to solve that, let's try something else. We keep trying. It's an experiment mindset. Uh, number eight, another thing that happens uh, that, that I use all the time is developing your own jargon. When people start thinking, uh, listening about Scrum and Scrum Masters and dailies and product owners and, and, and test-driven development and behavior-driven development, people get curious about that. I even introduce my own jargon. I talk about orcs at the gates and the muffins oven and the sardines and coffee pattern. And people are like, sardines and coffee, what's that? And they are like, eh, you haven't been in the trainings. And then suddenly you are like, these are the cool guys, they have like their own way of talking, they have their own secret language, and I'm not part of that, and I want to belong, <laughs> and I'm not using that language. And that really works. Developing your own language for the transformation, developing your own terms, is something that also helps people to get interested in the transformation. So here you have eight ideas to try at the beginning of the process. I'm going to speed up. Um, when you start crossing to the big majority, to the, to the late majority and to the early majority, the first thing you have to do is ignore the laggards. Do not spend time listening to laggards. That's going to exhaust you. Those are toxic people and it's not going to work. Mark Twain once said, do not argue with the stupid. He will win because of his experience and he will bring you to his level. Okay? You will sound stupid because you are arguing with stupid people. He will win because he has more experience being a stupid person. In Spain, we have a saying, I'm going to try to translate that, that goes something like, do not fight with a pig in the, in the mud, because you will end up full of mud, and the pig likes it. Okay? So do not do that. Do not fight laggards, do not, uh, do not argue with laggards. Instead of that, listen to the skeptics. Skeptics will give you arguments. Try to pay attention to those arguments and try to debunk and prove those arguments wrong. Try to give them reasons to think otherwise. Eleven, be open and easy to follow. If someone wants to learn more about the transformation, they need to know where do they have to go. They need to know who they have to address. So we've done a lot of things. Like in Ericsson, for instance, we have Agile Corners. Two days a week, we will have 20 minutes where people will be gathering in a specific place of the building and they will be presenting for 20 minutes, live in talk style, some Agile topics. So if you wanted to know more, you just have to go to one of those Agile Corners and see the people that were coming and then ask them, talk to them. In Sudamericana, which is the biggest insurance company in Latin America, we have, we have the Achilles Corner and that's a full room in the building, which is in the basement, and there's nine people working there all the time. And if you have some problem, if you need training, if you don't know how to do that something, you just go there. You don't have to write an email or ask something or call. You just go there. There will be always someone that will immediately be available to, to help you. In Linda Medical, we did the Agile Safari. This is a practice I read about. Um, uh, in, uh, they do it in Google. What we did is we had some top executives going around the plant and seeing how teams were doing dailies. We showed them the boards, we showed them the burndowns, we showed them the perspectives, so they got to see how Agile was actually implemented in the organization, and they started to understand a lot of things. Number 12, have quick wins. As soon as possible, show people that this is working. Uh, one of the first things that will work really, really fast is the boards. Once you start using post-it notes and burn and you can see the state of the project, that's a quick win. And that's the reason that I, I, I like to have physical boards in the walls because they show something to the organization. We are doing stuff. Something is changing. Okay? That's a good one. And number 12, use customer testimonies. You, if you are going to buy, I don't know, a Volkswagen, do not talk to a Volkswagen seller. Talk to a Volkswagen owner. Talk to someone that drives a Volkswagen. So go to the client, to the customer of an Agile project, take record that person, video record that person with a mobile. Can you tell me in five minutes why did you enjoy 
to work in this agile project and then show that video to other people. We did that in Bangalore Occidente, one of the biggest malls in Colombia. We showed videos of happy customers. Some people in the company said, I've been 25 years in this company, it's the first time I see a happy customer. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is terrific. <laughs> we saw customers saying, it's amazing because they have been giving me stuff all the time and it was done brilliantly and very, very fast. And that was like a, you know, a huge, tipping point in the transformation. Number 14, have emotions and identity in mind. Again, Stephen Denning yesterday was talking about this exercise where you put yourself in the role of the person that is resisting the transformation. There's a technique out there called empathy maps. It's in the, you know, it's used by the design thinking community, the UX community, and also by several lean startup guys. And it's about trying to think why this person is going to be against the, the transformation. If you use empathy maps with the managers that are against Agile, and you start asking, what are these people hearing about Agility? Oh, they are hearing that in Agile there's no managers. And there's a product owner and there's a master, so they feel that they will have no role in the new transformation in the new organization. So they are afraid. And then you start to understand what's the concern of these people, even if it's not expressed that way. Fifteen, find champions. That means find someone in the company that is high enough in the management community and can support the transformation. Again, that's a tipping point. As soon as possible, try to have a sponsor for the transformation. Number sixteen, scripted. Give people guides, give people I mean, uh, the last one I did in Bank Colombia, which is the biggest bank in Colombia, we're doing an amazing transformation there, 200 scrum teams right now. Um, we wrote several guides on what's product ownership, what's a scrum master, how do you figure out who's the best scrum master in your environment, how do you figure out who's the best product owner for your team, because people didn't understand the concept of product owner, even though we have explained it over and over and over. So we created these guidelines so they could try and discover by themselves. We also, in many other companies, have created guidelines on how to write user stories, how to put information into Jira or whatever the software you're using. So give people steps, guidelines, like, like things that are very, very easy to follow, to, to mark the path. 17. Try to figure out if there's habits that people have that you can piggyback on. If people are already doing something, try to make your transformation part of that something that they are already doing. Like for instance, if they are going for breakfast together all uh, every day at 10, use that event to do the daily meeting. We do the daily meeting and we go for breakfast. Because they already have that habit of going for breakfast. So if you attach the daily meeting to the breakfast, now it's easier that they, will, they won't forget to do the daily meeting every day. So again, this is more things or more tips. Uh, the last three, modifying environment, I have a terrific story about that. <laughs> I'm going to try to tell it really, really fast. We had a team that was refusing to use uh, continuous uh, integration. That's incredible because uh, we have so many teams trying to do continuous integration and the managers say no. Here the managers were saying we need continuous integration and they were like no, 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 that's not possible in this environment. It will never work here. You don't understand. <laughs> So we built the continuous integration environment for them. Um, and then one day I said, you know, the build has been broken for six days and nobody's fixing the build. And they were like, oh, we didn't know the, the build was broken. And I'm like, well, the continuous integration system is sending you emails saying the build is broken. And they said, yeah, we were receiving all these emails all the time, so we filtered them. And I'm like, oh, brilliant. <laughs> So we created this screen that shows the state of the build in green and red, and we put it on the team environment. Still, people were not paying attention to the screen. So the next thing I tried, I moved the screen to a hallway where all the managers were passing by. And you know, the managers are not very intelligent, but they know that green is good, red is bad. <laughs> this was green yesterday, and today it's red. No, and they were like, tok, 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 touching the screen saying, oh, is this broken? <laughs> and we're like, no, that's not how you will fix the build. And then suddenly the team started to be very, very concerned about the state of the build. Okay, <laughs> war is war. <laughs> so this is modifying the environment and putting th things in the physical environment that will help the transformation. You can also make the alternatives painful. Like for instance, I have many companies where agile teams do not write reports anymore because all the information is on the board. 
and they are not required to estimate anymore. And then you have things that are not ideal and say, I have to do reports, I have to estimate. Why these guys do not have to do reports and do not have to do estimate? Oh, they're doing this agile thing, and then suddenly they are like, I want to do that agile thing too. Because now it's painful not to be doing the new stuff. Okay, so as soon as you can do that, that's amazing. That makes a lot of results. 20 will be use the group. In this same company I was talking about where people were refusing to do continuous integration, we started showing that we were saying, okay, you have to commit your software several times a day. And they were like, no, but that's not possible. That's not how we work here. And there was one person that was constantly arguing that that was not possible. But then we ran some statistics and we started to show the statistics. And the, the statistics show that everyone was actually committing code several times a day except him. Wow. <laughs> so we showed, and eh, maybe there's a problem with you and not with the whole problem. So that's using the whole group against the laggard. Okay? This is, can be dangerous because it can be perceived as an aggression, but sometimes using the, the peer pressure is more effective than having the manager pressure the people. And then number 21, and this is the end, keep going. Don't say, oh, that's everything. People are doing dailies and retrospectives and we have Scrum Masters. Done. Well, you have to keep going. And probably you will have to keep going for the rest of your life. Okay? So in order to finish, and I'm like uh, five minutes late, maybe my last words, <laughs> I usually end up like this. Oh my god, I have a word time. Uh, this is my I, this is how I try to draw Morihei Shiva. Morihei Shiva was the creator of Aikido. Um, and he was considered one of the great philosophers of Japan during the 20th century. And Morihei Ueshiba, he, when he was close to his death with 80 years, uh, he was still going to the dojo to train and everyone was saying, oh, sensei, sensei, stop training, that's not good for you, you're going to hurt yourself. And he was like, nah, this ancient guy still needs to train and train. So for me, it has always been very, very inspiring how people think that even though you are considered the best martial artist in Japan and you have, come, uh, uh, you have brought martial arts to a point where never nobody had experienced them, you still think that you have to improve and you have to keep training and there's things you can do different, okay? And then you have Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu. And if you figure out, you can see that Lao Tzu looks amazingly like Morihei Ueshiba. Like super, super, super. They look alike, okay? And, and Lao Tzu, who looks amazingly like Morihei Ueshiba, uh, he said something in the, in the way, in the, in the line of the leader is best when his presence is not noticed. When the work is done and the goal is achieved, people will say, we did it ourselves. And um, I do resonate with these words. I think that our goal as change agents is to, in, to engage people into this change initiative instead of giving people orders. Antoine de saint exupéry the, the writer of the, the Little Prince, he said, if you want people to build boats, instead of telling them to chop wood and to, I don't know, saw the sails, teach them to yearn from the loneliness of the ocean. Okay? Give them this inspiration so they are the ones that want to make the change. It's also something that gets reflected and it gets uh, very well expressed at the end of People Work, the book by uh, uh, Tom DeMarco and Timothy Lister. Okay? Um, and at the end of the book, they talk, they, they talk about the, the legend of Olga Gans, the giant of Denmark. And in Denmark, they seem to have the legend that there's a sleeping giant, Olga Gans. And if his Denmark is under danger, the giant will awake and it will defend the country. And in this sense, they say, your duty as change agents is not to defend Denmark. Your duty is to awake the giant. And the giant in your organizations is the collective power of all the people that form that organization. If everyone is hungry for the change, if everyone wants to change, not even the president, not even the owner, not even the CEO can stop that change. So I hope that this talk has given you ideas of things you can try in order to introduce the change in your organizations. And I hope it has inspired you to bring change into the world, bring improvement, and inspire people to have better environments. Thank you so much.